Okay, so I'm really excited to present this chapter and hopefully uh, hopefully you all had uh, got enjoyment from reading this chapter and um, were able to over the long uh, break that we had. Um, this is the uh, second to last chapter, Improving Performance. Um, especially, this is one that uh, I was especially interested in, um, specifically from like a shiny perspective. Um, I know this is more R in general versus shiny. There's also improving performance um, aspects and other specific to shiny and like the master and shiny book, but there's some good uh, details in this chapter, no matter what you're doing in R. So a quick overview. Um, this chapter was broken up into uh, five different parts for um, how to think about improving your code performance. Uh, so we'll take a look at each one of these as we go along. And please stop me if you um, have any questions and I'll try to monitor the uh, chat as well if you wanna put anything in there. All right, so the first one, uh, organizing your code. Uh, this is helpful for this is helpful for seeing what you've already tried and kind of comparing different methods. Um, and Hadley recommends that uh, you write a function for uh, each different approach so you can easily compare them. Uh, in, in this example, two different ways for computing uh, the mean. One uses uh, the function mean itself, and the other uses um, both sum and length. And uh, so two different methods. Also, just keep track of, um, of things you've used in the past, even if it didn't work out. Uh, it's a good way to um, track your improvement over time. Uh, so we have two different functions that we want to test out and see which one has better performance. Um, so in order to compare, we need to generate a representative test case. So what data we'll expect when we're running the code. Uh, for this, we, we just generate, um, was it like 10,000 uh, different numbers? Um, in this case, you don't want you don't want your representative uh, test case to be too big. Um, you want it big enough so you can see the differences between the two functions. Um, but I guess two things, if it gets too big is that it will take longer to run and you can't iterate as much. And then um, like once you get past a certain point uh, uh, in the size of your representative test case, it's not, it won't show the differences um, between them as much. It'll, it'll just be the time it takes to compute uh, whatever you're running. Uh, so do, so just be aware of that. And uh, it might take some tuning to um, find the right size for a test case. Um, and then once we have that, we need something to measure the functions with. Um, so we use benchmark. Uh, to compare the two different versions. Um, and in the book, there weren't unit tests, but um, 
that's something that he does suggest. Uh, so it's as simple as using this function, and then uh, the output will be um, uh, like the time it takes, basically. Uh, and there's, I think, the minimum time it takes, uh, the medium amount, and then I forget if this was like iterations per second. Um, but then you can see you can see which um, <clears throat> which approach is faster. Um, in this case, the second approach is faster, and I believe it's because uh, the function mean performs like extra computation for um, to be more precise, where this. Uh, this approach doesn't use that. So that's the main difference between those two. All right, so that's the main idea behind um, organizing, your, organizing your code. Uh, the next, like, the next thought or idea, um, for improving performance is to check if an, a solution already exists. Um, there's CRAN tasks views, which I'm not sure if I've ever been here before, um, but it looks like there's different um, categories that you can search for. Uh, uh, different uh, solutions on CRAN. Um, so that is an option. Uh, you can look for reverse dependencies of R, C++. Um, I think that's another like advanced way of looking for an existing solution. Uh, and we'll learn more about C++ in the last chapter. And then go ahead and uh, talk to others, uh, whether it's your colleagues or uh, people within the R4DS community. Uh, those are good resources. Um, Google, and specifically, uh, I learned this from uh, this chapter. There's like a specific R search you can use called RSeq. Um, so that's interesting. Uh, of course, Stack Overflow. Um, uh, we've talked about that and how you can re recreate um, reprexes um, and search for other people's uh, questions and seeing if that's something you need. Um, and then the R Studio community is a good re is another good resource. Um, I'm not sure if this will change over to posit community or if posit community is like the big umbrella for the r community uh, but either way uh, it's still our community community r studio um so just another uh, good source for questions answers and checking for existing solutions. Um, I'm not sure if any of you have other ones outside of um, these listed. Um, I know I know there's an R Discord as well. Uh, let's see. I wonder if there's a task view for R Universe. Oh, what? You've got, you've piqued my interest. Um, oh, this is really cool. Um, awesome. Do you wanna, um, do you wanna talk about this at all, Arthur? Um, it looks like a great resource. 
Yeah, just just very briefly, I think this is kind of a the idea behind it is to have another another repository that's not um, that's I guess kind of user curated rather than expert curated. So you know, mm -hmm. CRAN there's a certain barrier to entry for CRAN, um, which is good and that I guess you can expect a certain level of quality, but bad in the sense that there's kind of a whole um, you know if this if these are research papers like gray gray literature you know so there are lots of things that exist on github but not on cran for a variety of reasons the idea here i think um uh, is is to make all of those things available um to, to users i'm not sure if there's a way to install but i think you can kind of find a lot of a lot of little um packages here that may not be available through uh through cran awesome yeah thank thanks for sharing that um yeah, this the FF verse caught my mind, my eye because um, yeah, I thought that Tan was uh, one of the uh, maintainers for this package, and I believe it. Yeah, I think it's only on GitHub, and I'm not sure if it's on Cran at all. But yeah, that's that's really cool. Thank you, um, thank you for sharing that. Um, so yeah, those those are definitely the main ones, and um, I'm sure this will continue to grow as uh, the R community grows as well. Um, so the third idea here for improving performance, um, I I think this kind of idea was was brought up um, in previous chapters. Um, do as little as possible um, or or be lazy. Um, and I guess um, meaning you you want to you want to create your function or or whatever uh, code you're doing to do as little as possible, meaning it will still, do the core of its functionality, but with stripping out any ex extraneous um, stuff for things that it doesn't necessarily need to do um, so it can perform faster. Uh, so, so some examples here and, and to um, kind of draw this idea out a little more. Um, uh, so you want to use a function tailored to uh, a more specific type of input or output um, or to a more specific problem. Um, yeah, for example, uh, row sums, call sums, uh, and the like are faster than uh, the equivalent that use um, apply because they are vectorized. Um, and v apply is faster than s apply because it pre-specifies the output type. Um, so yeah, um, these are just examples, but uh, I'm sure there are, are like countless other examples where um, there might be two similar functions and uh, one one's just faster because uh, uh, it's either vectorized or or does something else. Um, and it's not just functions either. it's it's um, like how you write code as well. Um, for example, uh, using any uh, the any function um, versus uh, versus n uh, is much faster because you're just using, uh, test equality versus um, testing set inclusion. Uh, so same functionality, but uh, different performance levels. Um, some functions coerce their inputs into a specific type. Um, so if your input's not the right type, uh, it's just doing extra work. Um, 
Uh, for example, apply will always turn a data frame into a matrix. Um, so yeah, if, if you're worried about performance, um, either find something else or or don't um, don't feed apply a data frame and feed it a matrix instead. Uh, so some other examples uh, that the book goes over, um, reads.csv, specify known column types with call classes. Um, so, so it's not like guessing the column type or, or whatever. Uh, or also consider switching to um, a reader or a data table for um, reading CSVs. Those are faster than read.csv. Um, and there's there's definitely other um, there's like countless other ways to uh, read in data fast as well um, besides these listed. Um, with factor, specify known levels with um, levels. Uh, cut, um, don't generate labels with labels equals false if you don't need them, or even better, use find interval. Um, and then just a couple more, um, unlist with usenames equals false is much faster than not using that um, qualifier. And the interaction function, if you only need combinations that exist in the data, use drop equals true. Um, so those are just basic, or those are just uh, a small sample of um, like doing as little as possible. Um, and as you're writing your code or, or reading other people's code, definitely uh, think about that and, and how you can apply it if, uh, if you're looking to improve performance. Um, so, so this one was, um, this was an interesting idea. Uh, I wasn't really sure what method dispatch was when reading this chapter and I'm still not quite sure if I like totally understand it. Um, I think the core idea is that um, like when you're running a function or something, a uh, method dispatch is used for like, it can be used for like checking the inputs, uh, making sure it's like the right class or, or right type or, or whatever. Um, that's like the general idea of that. So when you're, when you're avoiding doing that, um, you can speed up the performance of your code, but that can also be, um, that can also be very dangerous because, uh, you're basically taking away uh, the guardrails that was set up for like those functions or or whatever you're taking away. Um, so so in this example, we're we're comparing um, mean to uh, mean dot default. Um, I forget what the I forget what the difference was between these two um i think maybe mean might check for nas um but in this example uh you're you're taking away um some sort of check and then you're getting a huge performance uh, boost because of that. Um, so I guess depending on what you want to do, um, 
like if performance is is very crucial um like yes go ahead do this um but be aware that uh there could be potential issues from from or uh trade-offs i guess for for improving your performance um another another uh example of uh avoiding the method dispatch is using uh the dot internal function as well um as you can see here it greatly uh increases performance over mean dot default even um let's see yeah so it it even increases from mean dot default um but if i go to r studio and uh type that in myself um it, it tells you what it's about. Internal performs a call to an internal code, which is built into the R interpreter. Uh, only true R wizards should even consider using this function, and only R developers can add to the list of internal functions. So, so yeah, that's definitely a big warning sign. Um, depending on um, how much performance you need uh just be <laughs> just be aware of that warning uh if you do intend to use dot internal um and then i think the last part was uh just another example of showing the difference between uh, the size of your uh, representative data input. Um, here we have um, what, like a, a hundred more, a hundred times more examples. It looks like um, so it's running longer, um, but really you're not seeing um much of a difference in the spread between these um running running the first one is is more than sufficient to see the differences in the functions yeah so that that's basically the idea behind uh method dispatch um the more or the, yeah, the more you go to the performance end of things, uh, you're gonna you're gonna be having some trade offs, um, and it can be risky. But um, yeah, that's I, I guess that's why it's a trade off. Um, let's see. So the next idea: avoiding input coercion. Um, so kind of similar to other, other ideas, uh, um, as an example, as dot data frame is slow because it coerces each element into a data frame and then R binds them together. Um, you can get around this by like building your own function and not doing that. Uh, so instead, if you have a named list with uh, vectors of equal length, uh, you can directly transform it into a data frame uh, without doing that. Um, so the book just had like um, a nice example of of uh, taking those vectors and transforming it into a data frame um, called Quick DF. And so if we compare, uh, you know, the initial uh, the initial function as dot data frame to our built function, um, there there's 
a massive difference uh, between the two. Um, but again, uh, uh, caveat, this method is fast because it's dangerous. Um, like there's a reason why uh, you you should use these by default is because they have like checks in place to make sure that your uh, like data is sound um, versus you you don't get the same benefit um, when optimizing for performance. So I think that's kind of the theme here. Uh, you can make something really fast, but uh, be aware of the caveats. Uh, the next idea is uh, to vectorize. So this is a popular um, concept um, um, for speeding up your code, making your code run faster. Um, Hadley said vectorization means finding the existing R function that is implemented in C and most closely applies to your problem. Uh, some vectorized functions that apply to many scenarios, uh, row sums, call sums, and then the same functions for means. Um, Vectorized subsetting can lead to big improvements in speed. Um, and then cut and find interval for converting continuous variables to categorical. Um, be aware of vectorized functions um, like these. And then a last bit of advice, matrix algebra is a general example of vectorization. And the last, uh, the last bit of advice is to um, avoid copies. Um, so uh, whenever you use functions like uh, C, append, R bind uh, to create a bigger object, R must first allocate space for the new object and then copy the old object to its new home. Um, I think this is something that as a new R user, when I was like first learning R, um, this was something I wasn't aware of um, and just didn't think of um, R creating like new copies and thus like slowing my code down. Um, so this is this is a great way to um, speed up your code. Um, and I forget what. Let me go over to the book. I forget what this example was uh, going over. Okay, so we generate some uh, random strings and then combine them either iterative, iteratively with a loop using collapse or in a single pa pass using paste. Um, note the performance of collapse gets relatively worse as the number of strings grows. Um, combining 100 strings takes almost 30 times longer than combining 10 strings. Okay, so this, yeah, these are the loops that we're comparing. Uh, it's much slower because it's um, copying information. Um, and so the the more the more represent representative data you have, the the larger uh, 
large the the longer amount of time it's going to take to um to run and i feel like for this um that it may be like exponentially slower too so this is definitely uh this is definitely one of the ideas you want to you want to take take home to your programming practices to uh to make sure uh this is an area you can you can definitely clean up for uh improving your speed cool so that those are the main ideas um we will uh, go over a case study that the uh, chapter um, that the chapter introduced. Um, uh, before that, um, any like any questions or or comments over um, any of these ideas or uh, techniques. All right, I'll uh, I'll uh, move on to the case study. Um, so here for the case study, um, it, it's based on an example in um, this paper uh, by Schwender and uh, Mueller, um, computing thousands of test statistics simultaneously in R. Uh, Hadley recommends reading the paper in full to see the uh, same idea for other tests. Uh, but in this specific example, um, we're going to run uh, we're going to run a thousand experiments. That's m on fifty individuals, and uh, that's n, and it will be um, it'll be divided into two groups. Uh, so either one or, or group two. Uh, we'll generate some random data to represent this problem. And so we're gonna we're gonna uh, develop uh, two different ways to um, to use the to use t test, um, and then we're gonna uh, iteratively improve uh, on the approach. Um, so the, the, the first, um, uh, the first approach is, is using, uh, t.test and the, uh, formula method. Uh, so that's the tilde. And then the second approach is to provide two vectors. Um, so here we have um like 0 0.2 seconds uh for for the first method and then 0 0.05 seconds for the second one um so this goes over like organizing your code having um uh different functions that you want to test out uh, perhaps if you want to be even more organized, you would uh, name the two as well. Um, so we'll we'll go ahead and see if we can improve on uh, the vectorization or providing two vectors. Excuse me. Um, uh, so one of those is um, add functionality. Oh. I'm sorry. So since we used um, since we used this method, we're going to need to add some functionality to um, save the values. 
and that's what we're doing here. So we do have a slight um, performance bump, but it's still much faster than our initial first method. Um, so if you look at the source code of uh, ttest.default, you'll see that it does a lot more than just compute the t statistic. Um, it computes like the p-value and um, I'm not sure if there's uh, more to it than just that, but um, the third idea of, of doing less work and doing as little as possible for if we want to improve the performance, we don't need that unnecessary work, like doing the p-value. Um, we just want to uh, do the t-test. Um, so instead of uh, t-test uh, function, we'll create our own t-test here. And so that's that's kind of the math behind it. And then um, and then when we test it out, um, we can see that um, we can see that we have a uh, much much improved performance when. Uh, taking out all of that extraneous stuff. Um, this gives us a six-fold speed improvement. Uh, so that, that is definitely pretty, pretty good. Uh, so we can do we can do a little better. Um, here we're we're using the um, formula method. Uh, we can vectorize it as well. And uh, once we vectorize uh, our code, it um, gets an even better improvement and it's down to 0. 0.005. Um, so a thousand times faster than what we started at. Um, so I guess depending on your performance needs, um, you could take your own code and run through like a similar exercise or like even if you don't need that much of a performance gain, um, like even the performance difference between uh, the first function and the second function uh, that's still pretty good. So, um, so yeah, definitely organize your code and, um, like you can tell like when your code performance is like good enough for you. And so that, that was basically it. Um, I, I do enjoy this this la last uh, little section that Hadley included, um, just some general ideas of uh, how to improve um, code performance. Um, one of the big ones is like just read our code. Um, like see how other people do things. Um, for example, uh, where was it here? For example, like the any versus the n, those are like uh, two different ways for doing the same thing. But um, like if you didn't see someone else do it, you might not think of it. Uh, so like reading our code, read our blogs uh, to see what other people have done and how they made their code faster. Um, highly recommended. 
uh, read other R programming books, um, like The Art of R Programming or R Inferno. Uh, and then outside of R, you can like take algorithm courses and like data structure courses. Um, here's an algorithms course on Coursera. Uh, looks like it has very, very high ratings, a lot of views, um, all online. Um, and then learn how to parallelize your code. Um, two great places to start, parallel R and parallel computing for data science. Um, and then, like, there's only so much... Uh, there's only only so many resources within that are R specific. So look elsewhere too. Uh, read general books about optimization, uh, like mature optimization or the classic pragmatic programmer. Um, and then just the last bit of advice, uh, read more R code, whether that's Stack Overflow, our mailing list, R for DS, uh, GitHub, all great resources. Um, you can learn a ton from other people. Um, and then don't be afraid to uh, ask questions on any place like this, um, any, any of these places. Don't be afraid to ask questions and don't be afraid to uh, give back and answer questions as well, because you'll learn something or most likely you may, may learn something answering questions as well. Yeah, so, uh, yeah that was that was improving performance. Um, I thought that was a fun chapter and uh, happy to hear your thoughts or, or questions or whatever. Thanks. So, um, yeah, I really like the chapter. <laughs> and uh, so I'm going to practice a bit more with the test case study, which looks uh, very useful. And then uh, I'm, I'm still a prediction about those things. So, quite difficult sometimes. But uh, practice is gold. And uh, the, the last section uh, um, was very uh, interesting as well. So, I'm going to look at some extra resources. I use Stack Overflow and so, so anytime I need it. Uh, um, yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you to um, uh, Arthur or uh, Olafemi. Uh, any thoughts or, or questions on, on uh, chapter 24? No, no, no. For my own side, I think it's a very uh, interesting chapter. I think you really talk over a lot about how we can speed up, uh, improve uh, the performance of our output. So I will still take more time to really look at the notes. Let's try and see how I can put it into practice. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, nothing, nothing from my side. I um, I'm just going to have to use this uh, chapter as a jumping off point for, for, for further study. Mm. Okay, I guess kind so, of the one, one area yeah. that came, came to mind is, um, uh, did it seem like there's kind of a best waste, kind of like the, is there, is there a, a reference best tool for measuring, for measuring time? I, I've kind of seen in various fora, People using different 
different tools like uh, what is it R R benchmark and microbench and things like that to measure um, compute time. Is, is this, does there seem like there's a dominant strategy here? Mm. I'm thinking here more for just like empirically determining like which, which is which is faster, right? Which of you know a few potential approaches. Um, I'm not sure about that. Um, yeah, I guess I assumed that uh, bench dot mark was um, was was one of the default ones, but um, I'm I guess I'm not aware of uh, of the other competitors. Yeah, this is a little bit of an old article I just dropped into the into the chat, but it mentioned a few of the tools I just cited. I, I, I know I've seen these kind of things on Stack Overflow and other places like that. Anyway, may, maybe just something for all of us to think about and look into. Um, yeah, I think I've used um, uh, the TikTok library before. Um, let's see, I, I'm thinking of my own practice. Um, like I have a function that, that I run every day and it, it outputs the, um, total time. And I guess I, and that uses sys.time, um, for computing the time it takes to run. Um, so yeah, I, I think, <laughs> uh, yeah, that's, I'll take a look at this article. That's, it's definitely interesting seeing the different uh, approaches. Yeah, and maybe, we, I mean, I guess this is kind of setting up the next chapter, but um, sorry, I didn't have much time this week to really dive into this chapter is whether this chapter discussed any of the um, sort of um, advice on whether to use R or whether to use, let's say C++, um, if, if there's anything around that, maybe we'll get into that next week. Yeah. Next week, we, we, we are actually the, the end of the, this book club, this course. And so the, the, the last chapter is about uh, writing the R code um, in C++. Which I'm going to, to just uh, have a look at the surface of, of it, because um, I'm not sure if uh you any of you have uh experience in um uh programming uh in c plus plus so it's basically not that difficult uh and it's behind so basically what happened uh behind the the r code in some some senses it's a bit more articulated uh, and uh, you know the syntax uh, is like longer, so you need to use more uh, signs like you know um, greater than or uh, less than. So, so you use more more signs for for wrapping up your code, but then. Uh, um, it turns out to be useful as well. Obviously, R is it's a little bit, it's just ironically, a little bit straight, straightforward. And um, so we, we'll have a look, but just, uh, as I said, uh, just, just to understand what, what's happening there. Um, and that's it. So thank you very much. So we, uh so we did a good job and uh so i look forward if you have uh, nothing else to uh to add 
look forward to seeing all of you next week. See you next week. Awesome. Okay. See you next week. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you.